a shocking experience that would be. Good to see you all. Let's take a look at our bulletin real quick. Let me just mention a couple things to you uh, in this new year. On the back of the bulletin is all the various activities and opportunities for fellowship, Bible study, worship, discipleship, all those things that we do as a church. Those are all open and available. And hopefully you'll participate if you're able, according to your work schedule and other things, or you'll pray for those things that you're unable that we can continue to do the job God's called us to do. Uh, tonight at 6, if you're able to come back, we'll worship a little bit. We'll talk in great detail about our Through Every Door emphasis, which I mentioned last week. You can go on the computer and hear about it through the YouTube thing. I don't have anything to do with that, but it's on online. So you can go back and listen to that, and the, uh, the various aspects of that and calendar, we'll be talking about that tonight. We'd love for you to come back and be part of that if you can. If not, that information will be readily available through the mail and the website, the Facebook page, and all that. So if you can't get here, that'll still be made available to you. Down at the bottom left-hand corner, we've got our weekly reading. There's a Bible reading schedule. If you'd like to read through the Bible with us this year, if you have your own way of doing that, that's great. But we're encouraging people to do that. I had mine here somewhere. I just took mine and folded it up like a little bookmark, and then I mark it off each day. This morning we read uh, Genesis 19 and 20, and... You see it goes through chapter 35. Now I'll say something this morning I'll probably never say again. You can still catch up this week. But next week you just need to start. Every week's a new week. What happens is people try to read through and they get behind. Then they get frustrated and discouraged and they quit. Don't quit. Every week's a new week. Just start where we are. And then there's a memory verse each week. Now you can sit down at the table. You know, that's where people sit down and eat. Or at least they used to. <laughs> you can sit down at the table and share that with your kids or with one another and memorize a verse a week. I'm preaching from the verse we memorized last week. At least that's my jumping off point this morning, Genesis 1.1. But Genesis 1.27 says that God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. So that's the verse this morning. That's the gist of it anyway, depending on what version you read. But it reminds us that God created man, God created woman. That's the way he created them. And that's God's intention. So that's a reminder verse. And each week there will be a verse there to memorize if you want to be part of that. And then our Through the Bible emphasis has not only the reading of the Bible each day, if you want to do it that way, and the uh, Bible study time at 930, we're doing a journey through the Bible. And if you want to be part of that, it's a great time to start. You can start any time, but it's great to start at the beginning. So if you want some of that material, just let me know. We've got three groups meeting right now. And there's room for you if you'd like to come and join one of our groups. You're more than welcome to do that. And then I'm preaching through uh, the book that we're studying on Sunday morning in our Sunday school, and that's Genesis. So you can find that real quick. It's in the beginning. <laughs> Let's turn there together. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You may have a version that says heaven. Well, what's up with that? Well, the Hebrew concept of heaven is three. There's the heaven we call sky, and the heaven we call space, and the heaven we call heaven, where God lives. You can see sky by day, and you can see space by night, but you can only see God's heaven by faith. And so... The whole Hebrew concept of the dwelling place of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the book of Genesis becomes that book of beginnings. Of the creation of heaven, earth, the creation of animals and mankind, male and female, as Genesis 1.27 says. Creation of marriage. Marriage was God's idea. Creation of family. Uh, all those things began in Genesis. And unfortunately, as we'll see in a few minutes, so did sin in Genesis. But thankfully, so did salvation. We'll see that too. So Genesis is the beginning of everything but God. God has no beginning. God is eternal. And He's the God who is changeless, no beginning, no ending, eternal, the great I Am, I like to say he's the God of beginnings 
and the God of never endings. In fact, I thought about titling this message that way, but I didn't do it. But I just had to throw that out because it was on my mind. And because God is who He is, and He does what He does, you and I can become everything He wants us to be. We can begin again. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning of a few passages here in Genesis, if you keep your Bible open. The idea that we can begin again. I was watching a documentary a few months ago on the Golden Gate Bridge fascinating how it was built and the, you know, the, the money that was spent and the time it took and you know back then in the 19 late 20s and 30s the technology was a lot different and a lot more manpower was involved and how so many men fell to their deaths in the beginning of the, the beginning of the, of the bridge and then they put a safety net under the bridge and and men would fall but they wouldn't die they just fall into the net that's where we get the idea of safety net and what was fascinating was not only did no, no more men die, but they got the bridge done 25% faster because men weren't afraid anymore. You know, they, they weren't afraid of falling. They were afraid of dying. <laughs> so they still fell, but the net caught them. I thought that was interesting. But the most fascinating part that I remember was the maintenance of the bridge, how they take care of the bridge, because as it stretches out there against... Uh, San Francisco to Oakland in the, in the Golden Gate Bay there, there's a lot of assault and a lot of erosion, a lot of corrosion. And so they're painting. They paint the bridge with this special paint. It's called International Orange is the color. It's got a special epoxy makeup, chemical makeup that's supposed to be more resistant to the heat and the sun and the waves and the wind and the salt. And so it takes seven years to paint the Golden Gate Bridge, at least the article I read on Wikipedia. That's what it said. And they've got several crews that are working on different sections of the bridge all the time. They never stop. But when they get finished, they ask one of the guys that was working on one of these crews, when you get finished, what do you do? You know what he said? We start over. <laughs> We begin again. And I thought about that when I got to Genesis 1.1. It's the idea that we can begin again with God. That God is a God of new beginnings. And of course, first Sunday of the year, when's a better time to talk about it? The idea of beginning again. Now there's two parts to beginning again that you may want to jot down. They're pretty simple, straightforward, but when applied over time, they can make all the difference, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Number one, you've got to begin. <laughs> Obviously, you've got to begin. And Genesis 3 tells us why. Turn there with me. Genesis chapter 3. I'm just going to read without too much comment a story we've all read before, or at least I think most of us had, or at least we've heard about. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Of course, you know, God didn't say you can't touch it, but she's thinking about it. <laughs> he said, don't eat it. And she says, we're not even supposed to touch it. So they are leaning that direction, as we sometimes do. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. You'll be as God's, knowing good and evil. Like, that's a good thing to know evil. But anyway, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, exposed. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where are you? Remember, when God asks a question, He's not looking for information. Where are you? And He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded you should not eat? And the man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Sin came in. The beginning of sin. And sin separates us from God. Sin isolates us from one another. Sin dominates us in our daily living. So Genesis 3.15, right on the tail end of the tail of that serpent, God gave the first promise of salvation. Notice at verse 15. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, between your seed and her seed. Now mark that her seed if you like to mark in your Bible or underline. That speaks of the virgin birth. We know the male provides the seed in conception. But God said, somebody's coming, it's going to be the seed of the woman. And of course, we know that's Jesus Christ. Now this didn't sneak up on God. God didn't say, oh, now what am I going to do that they've sinned? We know later on in Scripture that Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before there was ever a sin, before there was ever a man or a woman, God had a plan that we could begin again. But of course, in order to begin again, you've got to begin. And that's what is promised in verse 15. When you think about Genesis chapter 3, you think about John chapter 3. In fact, Genesis says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Genesis and John go together like that. So when we think about Genesis 3 and the fact that sin came, we think about John 3 and the man who came, Nicodemus. Remember the story? He came to Jesus by night. The Bible says that he was a religious man. He's even called the teacher of Israel. He was a rabbi, a teacher. He taught the Old Testament. He memorized the scriptures. He had the word and uh, believed it religiously. The Bible says he was a moral man. They strove as Pharisees to keep the 613 commands of Moses, plus all the commands that they'd added through the rabbis down through the years. And yet for all of Nicodemus' religiosity and morality, and we would have accepted him into any of our churches. Oh my, he'd been faithful, student of the scriptures, probably a good tither. <laughs> had a good family, good reputation, and yet old Nick knew something was missing for all of his religion and for all of his morality. And so here comes Nicodemus to see Jesus. He's, he's seen what he's done, he's heard his teaching, and he's sincere. He's so sincere. He's so intentional in trying to understand the ways of God, and he knows for all that he knows there's something he doesn't know, you know? And so he comes to Jesus by night and he says, Jesus, Master, we know you've come from God because no man can do the things that you do unless he become from God. Remember what Jesus said? Thanks, Nick. I, no. <laughs> he said, you must be born again. For all of Nicodemus' goodness, for all of his morality, for all of his sincerity, he had never begun. He was what the Bible calls dead in trespasses and sins. All of our religion, all of our morality, all of our good works, all of our good attentions will never help us begin a life with God. And so Jesus said, you must be born again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man, woman, boy, girl, be in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. That's where it begins. You can't begin again unless you begin. And so I have to ask you, have you begun? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? These two girls baptized. If they hadn't trusted Jesus, they would have just got wet. <laughs> and me too, <laughs> under false pretenses. But they've accepted the Lord into their heart. And the Bible says we don't have to understand anything except the only thing, and that's that Jesus died for sinners. He rose for sinners. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Therefore, I trust Him as my Savior. That's all it takes. That's how we begin. That's how we're born again. Now, we should grow, obviously. We ought to develop our faith and become all God wants us to be. But we can't until we begin. And Nicodemus did begin, as we know from reading on later in the book of John. and won't go there, but eventually him and Joseph of Arimathea take the body of Jesus off the cross and bury it in Joseph's tomb. So when Nick came through, 
He had some struggles. He had some praying to do. He had to reconfigure everything he believed. But he began. He was born again. I can't help but tell the story. Uh, Billy Graham liked to tell it, and I, I think it's a fantastic story. 1924, World Series, Washington Senators playing the New York Giants. Only time the Washington Senators ever won the World Series. Seventh game, score was tied. One of their outfielders, Goose Goslin, came up to bat. Goose was called Goose because of the way he ran. He flapped his arms when he ran, either running the bases or out in the outfield. He's in the Hall of Fame as a baseball player, but they called him Goose because of the way he flapped his arms. He came up to bat, had, a, had an odd stance, seen old newsreel footage of him on old sports guy. You know that. Maybe you're not. But hang with me. Hang with me. And pitcher pitched, strike one. Pitcher pitched, strike two. Third pitch, he hits this screaming line drive. The historians say it never got about 12 feet above the ground. A screaming line drive to left center field. They thought it was going to be a home run. They thought it was going to win the World Series, but it hit about six inches below the top of the wall, and it careened off in such a way as the, the outfielders weren't able to corral the ball quickly, and Goose is running. He's running around first base. He's running around second base. He's running third base, and he holds up at third base. The third base coach holds him up, but about that time, the outfielders bobbled the ball, and the coach sent him on in. Come on in. Come on. And Goose started up again, flailing those arms to run home. The, the relay went to the shortstop. The shortstop threw the ball in, and Goose slid underneath the catcher. Safe! And the Washington Senators won the World Series. They were celebrating. They were ecstatic. Nobody noticed, because of all the euphoria, all the celebration. Nobody noticed the great Hall of Fame coach for the New York Giants, John J. McGraw. He come out of the dugout. He looked over at the first baseman. He looked over at the catcher. He nodded. The catcher threw the ball to the first baseman. The first baseman stepped on first base, and the first base umpire said, Goose Goslin is out. He's out. And all of a sudden, everybody realized something was going on and all the hubbub and the euphoria and the celebration. And the first base umpire said, he missed first base. And you know, you ball players know you can appeal. And so they appealed, they threw the ball to first base, and Goose Goslin missed first first base. Now, fortunately, the game went into extra innings. Walter Johnson, the big train, he's in the Hall of Fame too, the great strikeout pitcher. He was in the twilight of his career, but he came in and pitched, and the Senators won in the 12th inning. Why did I tell that story? Nicodemus had missed first base. A lot of people think they're okay with God, but they've missed first base. They go through life achieving this, accomplishing that, doing the other, and they've missed first base. One day they're going to face an almighty God, thinking their works are good enough, thinking their life is good enough, thinking they're better than the people they work with, better than the people they go to school with, better than the people in their neighborhood, and they may be, but they missed first base. There's first base right there. The cross of Jesus Christ, and that's where it all begins. And you can't begin again Unless you begin. Unless you begin. And so Genesis 3 tells us the story of where we've sinned, the beginning of sin, but also the beginning of the story of God's redemption, of sending us a Savior. Several years ago, I was asked to preach a funeral over in Tilden at the Presbyterian Church over there. It's a long story. But the young man that passed away was in his 40s, struggled with drug abuse and different things. And his mother called me on the phone, and she asked me if I would preach on John 3.17. She said, you probably don't know John 3.17, preacher. Well, I quoted it to her, <laughs> which made her happy. <laughs> but everybody knows John 3.16. John 3.17 says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, we're already condemned. I think some of us think we're like uh, one of those houses on Fixer Upper. You know, we're not so bad. We got some moldy carpet, knock a wall out here, and put an island in the kitchen there, and we'll be okay. No, 
We're completely condemned. It would be like old Chip and Joe took the house and put $125,000 into it, but they didn't deal with the toxic mold. Inhabitable, uninhabitable house. That's what we are. We're good, but we're never good enough. And so God sent His Son in the flesh, and in the flesh He condemned sin in the flesh that we might be made right with God. <laughs> That's the good news of the gospel. So you got to begin. You say, Brother Rob, you parked the truck here quite a while. Yeah, yeah, I know. I want you to make sure you're there. You've trusted Jesus as your Savior, that He's yours and you're His. That's how you begin. Now you go to some other churches, won't mention any denominational names, but if you go through this and do that and do the other, you're okay. Well, that's only okay if your heart's okay. I'm not going to put down those other churches, but in the Baptist church, some of them still, we emphasize the fact that we are sinful. Our sin is an offense to an almighty God, but that God loves sinners so much that He sent His Son that we might be saved and come to Him and begin. So I want to emphasize that to you. Now turn over to chapter 15, Genesis 15. So number one, you've got to begin. And after you accept Christ as your Savior, you do like these young ladies, you get baptized and you get in the book and you get in a class and you get in a group and you get in a church and you grow and you go. <laughs> and maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you've begun, but you need to begin again. Somebody once said, maybe an old uh, Ben Franklin, poor Richard's almanac, well begun is half done. And that's true. But well begun is not done. It's undone. So we begin, and then we begin again. We find Abraham here. Abraham was called by God in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham is the father of the faith. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, and so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> Go back to Bible school with me. But in Genesis 15, God is calling Abraham again, because Abe struggled, like we all do. He heard from God. He saw God. He had the promises of God. He believed God, verse 6 tells us, and it was counted him for righteousness. But Abraham wavered sometimes, like we do. He drifted sometimes, like we will. And so, at this beginning of the year, maybe that's you. Maybe you're here, but you're not here. Maybe you're God's, but you're not walking with God. Maybe you're sort of, kind of, but not really like you... And you need to say, today I'm going to begin again. You're born again. You're going to heaven. You know that. You're a child of the King. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Your sins are under the blood of Jesus. Praise His name. But now's the time at the beginning to say, I'm going to begin again. I used to and I want to. I should and I'm going to. That's the second part of this message. And that's where Abraham was. The Lord appeared to him there in chapter 15 and said, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding reward. And Abraham says, Lord, I'm going to paraphrase verse 2. Look at it with me, whatever version you're reading. Lord, you promised me a child, and I still don't have one. That causes us trouble sometimes. When God speaks, when we believe, and yet it takes time, and there's difficulty, and there's trouble in our lives, we sometimes doubt we sometimes drift, and we sometimes wonder. Verse 3, Behold to me, you've given no seed. I'm still waiting, God. I'm still waiting. Can I really trust you? I was on fire when you called me in Genesis chapter 12. I was ready to go. I left my daddy. I left my home. I left everything I knew. To follow you to a place you said you'd show me, I still haven't seen it. Some of us is like that today. We've been walking with God a while. There's stuff we haven't seen. We believed it. We believed our marriage was going to get better. We believed our kids were going to get right. We believed God was going to answer this prayer. We believed He was going to move me to this career. It hadn't happened. In fact, it looks like it's getting worse <laughs> sometimes. What do we do? Well, we need to begin again. And beginning again basically means just coming back and doing what you know to do. Being faithful to God as He's faithful to you. 
trusting Him and obeying Him, walking by faith, not by sight, not trying to figure it all out, but trying to believe that He's working on my behalf in every situation. I wrote this down this morning. To begin again, you simply return to doing those things you know you should be doing. Well, that's pretty profound, isn't it? Not. <laughs> Simple. Simple, basic, spiritual calisthenics, fundamentals. To begin again, you simply return to doing those things you know you should be doing. Now, that means we've all got room for improvement. Amen? <laughs> so let's begin again. Let's purpose in our heart this day that yesterday's in the rear view, and let's move forward by faith. Let's say hats off to the past and coats off to the future as we move forward by faith. We need to be like that little boy I heard about. He went to school his first day of school. He's so excited. <laughs> I mean, he's busting buttons trying to get out of the car to get in the door, you know. And uh, his mama picked him up when school was over, and he was all glum. And she said, well, what did you learn today, Timmy? He said, not enough. She said, what do you mean not enough? He said, well, I've got to go back tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We've got to go back tomorrow. We've got to get up tomorrow. We've got to go into it tomorrow, just like today. Trusting God and believing that He is working on our behalf. We must begin again. And that looks like chapter 15, like i just been mentioning it. Verse 6, Abraham believed in the Lord. Now, he believed before. Now, he's believing again. He's beginning again. And he counted it to him for righteousness. You believe again, you believe, and you keep believing. You keep starting every time you stop. And you never stop starting. <laughs> you restart. You do it again and again and again and again. And that's what the book of Genesis is all about. We can begin again. Adam and Eve began again. Noah began again. Abraham began again. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. All through this book, you see people who are just like you and me. They put their pants on one leg at a time or threw their toga over their head one head at a time, <laughs> whatever the case may be. And they struggled and they failed, and yet they were trusting in a God who's the great I Am. And God says to you and I, you can begin again. No matter what happened last year, you can begin again. No matter what people say or think about you, you can begin again. No matter what the devil is presently trying to do to you, you can begin again. No matter how you feel about it, you can begin again. In your walk with God, in your marriage, as a parent, with your money, with your career, no matter what's going on in your life, God says you can begin again. God says to this church, we can begin again because it's not based on you or me. It's all based upon Him and His faithfulness and His goodness and His mercy. Now, at 5 o'clock this morning, I wrote this down. I want you all to write this down. Get your pencil out unless you've got a really good memory. And if you don't hear anything else I said, hear this, and you're going to need it again before this year is over. This is so good. Every once in a while, God says something to me, and I remember. <laughs> Here it comes. I'm going to say it two or three times. Your worst day with God is better than your best day without God. I don't know what you're all going through. I know what some of you are going through. But I don't know what everybody's going through because I'm not God. But let me say this. Your worst day with God is better than your best day without God. So don't leave here without God, whether you're beginning or whether you're beginning again. Your worst day with Him, whatever that is, and you may not have experienced it yet. You may think you have. But you don't know. I don't either. But your worst day with Him is better than your best day without Him. It was New Year's Day, not this year, several years ago. It was New Year's Day. I'll never forget it. I knew that I had to begin again. I didn't want to. 
I didn't feel like it. And the worst thing was, I didn't know how. My wife had died. And I was alone for the first time in 36 years. I mean, it just cut me in half. And, you know, she died on a Tuesday, and we had her funeral here on a Saturday, and I preached it. The next day was Sunday, her birthday, I preached it. Kept on moving and got through the holidays, basically because a lot of people prayed for me. I had a four-year-old boy. Kept me from losing my mind. And there I was, sitting, looking out the window, not at the house we live in now, but the other house. Bright day, but it was cold, a beautiful bright day. And there I was, sitting there, looking out that window. Scared, spitless. Scared, didn't know what to do, or how to go. The holidays that kind of just pushed me through, the Thanksgiving and the Christmas and all that, I just kind of got pushed through. But there I was. I was sitting in a chair, looking out the window at the very spot where my wife had died. Her bed was there. And I had the bird feeder where she could look at the birds. She couldn't get out of bed anymore the last six weeks. And uh, she got a lot of enjoyment out of watching those birds fly and spar and do what birds do. That was her whole enjoyment as she tried to breathe. So the bed was gone, the chair was there, and I was sitting at that spot. <laughs> and I, I just didn't want to do it, but I had to. And every day from that day forward, almost every day, I would say, Lord, I know I'm going to make it, but I don't know how. Lord, I know I'm going to make it, but I don't know how. Here I am. <laughs> and I still don't know how. But you can begin again. I know. The old song says it this way. Have you failed in your plan or your storm-tossed life? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. You remember it? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. He will keep to the end. He's your dearest friend. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. You can begin again.